Welcome back to my first Let's Play of the first Siberia GOG version. And we are about to uh, be a part of Professor Pond's lecture. I'm not even sure what that's going to give us, but hopefully something. Before that, though, yes, as always, if you are enjoying the channel or the video or anything else connected to it, I would be so glad if you dropped a sub or a like. And now, just, yeah, we have the Giancala Cola, and that will give us better eyesight. We got some delicious wine, well, hopefully delicious wine. And we have that voice cylinder. That's all we have. Okay, let's head up there and see if we can uh, listen in. Oh, wait. And I think it was up here. It better be. Uh, oh, there we go. Ah, there you are, Miss Walker. Good, good. Uh, take a seat quickly. I'm impatient to start my lesson. My young friends, a very exciting discovery, unimaginable up until only a few hours ago, has come into my hands and has finally allowed me to complete my study on the mysterious Yukol people. Lights, please. The Yukols are a people from the far north about whom very little is known. They live far away, very far away, on the frozen borders of Siberia. This distance and the climatic conditions of the region, which are unfavorable to human existence, have limited the size of the Yukon population and kept it out of reach of the scientific world. The handful of slides that follow are actually the only documentation we have in our possession. It was a Russian explorer who made these drawings and took these photographs a hundred or so years ago. Today, we owe what we know about the Yukon people and their culture to him. We know that the origins of the Yukos date back to the last Ice Age. And curiously, evidence of their presence has been found in Western Europe and more precisely in the prehistoric caves at the heart of the Alps. This people, it seems, undertook a long migration over centuries towards the far north of the globe. The reasons for this migration are due to the importance of the mammoth in their craft, trade, and culture. They used them for transportation and as beasts of burden. The mammoth brought them meat, skins, fat, and ivory. Man and animal lived in symbiosis. There's no doubt about it. Mammoths started to drift away from the region due to changing climatic conditions, and the Yukos followed them to the north, to the edges of Siberia. Prehistoric cave drawings, identified as Yuko in origin, first led me to the extraordinary hypothesis that the Yukos had managed to domesticate the mammoth. They are, to the best of our knowledge, the only prehistoric people to represent a man riding a mammoth. <laughs> Today, because of this genuine mammoth skin effigy, identified by myself as an authentic Neolithic object, I can confirm this hypothesis. Yuko forebearers managed to tame mammoths. Prehistoric man uses little imagination. He draws what he sees and represents scenes from real life. This familiar day-to-day -day object is actually a children's toy. As we have seen, Yukol existence was inextricably linked to that of the mammoth. They used its skin for clothing and to make the roofs and walls of their houses. They used the tusks to build the frameworks of their homes as well as weapons, tools, and jewelry. Curiously, the disappearance of the mammoth 12,000 years ago had no immediate effect on the Yuko's way of life. It seemed that for a long time after, the people maintained their strong bond with the mammoth through the centuries. As incredible as it may seem, the Yuko people have continued right up until the start of this century to feed themselves on mammoth meat and to use the skin for clothing and shelter. Their ivory craftwork industry is still flourishing. 
it would appear that to preserve ancestral customs, the Yukos learned how to exploit through the centuries the large number of frozen mammoth carcasses that were perfectly preserved in the ice of the Siberian tundra. They have been able to live mainly off this enormous freezer stock for almost 30 centuries. As plausible as this explanation may seem, it seems it is not enough for the scientific community who, I will confess, is greatly perplexed by the question. In the absence of acceptable scientific evidence, we have to make do with Yukal Shaman artifacts. The research department that I have the honor to represent today lends no credence to the myths and legends that these tribal charlatans peddle. We have to take their stories at face value. Mere tales to while away the long Siberian winter. The legend of the Siberian Ice Ark is a very good example. You are invited to find out for yourselves from the pamphlet that I had passed around to you. This legend would have us believe that today, somewhere on a lost island to the north of Siberia, there are living mammoths still in existence, a sort of hangover from the Ice Age. This small herd has been miraculously preserved for more than 120 centuries by the Yukol's tender care. And the island on which the pachyderms are said to live is called Siberia. My friends, I advise you to resist the temptation you may have to believe in this pish and tish. The island of Siberia is not charted on any map, and the idea that mammoths have survived to the 21st century is an idle scientist's pipe dream. The Yukals were sadly among the first victims of the colonization of continental Siberia led by the Russians in the 20th century. The Kolkovs and Sovkovs systems, as well as the exploitation, disdain, and humiliation the people had to suffer, marked a definitive break in the Yukol's traditional lifestyle. And since the collapse of the communist regime, the Yukol population finds itself confronted with the same political and social upheavals that other Siberian communities are experiencing. There are two consequences to arise from this. Some Yukols have lost their tribal identity and have integrated into the Russian population. Others, however, have sought long and hard to re-establish links with their ancestral culture that was lost under the Soviet regime. Now, at the start of the 21st century, the last true surviving Yukols have gone to live on the vast territories of their ancestors. Nobody knows today where they live, or how they survive. Their very existence would be a matter for speculation if they did not turn up periodically at the tundra's most isolated fur trading posts to exchange mammoth tusks for essential items. There ends my lecture for today. Thank you for being among us today, Miss Walker. Please make your way to the laboratory where you will find your mammoth doll. There are also photocopies of my lectures should you so require them. Oh, so that dude is just always hanging out here? Is this now open? No point. It's locked. Oh, they locked after themselves. How rude. Anyway, that was a lecture. And we also now know that we will be getting our doll back and also a pamphlet. Professor, it's me. I have come to pick up the mammoth doll. The doll is waiting for you there, Miss Walker. 
Please take good care of it. Don't worry. I'm beginning to get quite attached to it myself. Can I trouble you just a little longer? With pleasure, Kate. I'm all ears. Could we get a little pamphlet? What would you say about seeing Hans Varlberg again? After all, you could come with me and help me find him. <laughs> Young lady, you are very kind. <laughs> I'm far too old for such escapades. I hope I haven't dis- Sorry? No, 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 not at all, my dear child. Is that the pamphlet? Yes, I think it is. The Legend of the Ivory Arc. And... Right, it's not too long, so let's actually read it. The last Ice Age ended when the planet warmed up. This sudden clim climatic change threatened the existence of many animal species, including mammoths inhabiting the far northern Siberian wastes. It is said that the Yukos people decided to follow Noah's example and build an enormous ark to try to preserve the mammoth's existence. They lived in symbiosis with the pachyderm, which was at the heart of their religious worship. The ship was constructed entirely from mammoth tusks. A small herd of the mammoths was installed on board with enormous quantities of fodder. Control of the ship was entrusted to a handful of particular intrepid Yugo clans. Their mission was to take the animal to, the, to other lands with pastures more befitting to their survival. On day, one day, 50 summers later, a legend would have it the Ark returned to its starting point. The Euclid were astonished to find nobody aboard apart from the carcasses of several mammoths, perfectly preserved in the ice encased in the ship. The clansmen believed this was a mysterious sign from the gods, and they ate the mammoths in a memorable feast. One week later, the Ark set sail once more, carried away by the currents. Again, it returned half a century later with not a soul on board, except more well-preserved frozen mammoth carcasses. This mystery continued for a millennia. Each time the surprisingly well-preserved mammals appeared out of nowhere, the Yukos interpreted the phenomenon as a benevolent offering from their dead companions who were believed to have perished on the Ark's first voyage in some horrendous maritime cataclysm. It was believed that their souls had found eternal rest on a mythical island that the shaman named Siberia. They construct a whole religion around this belief, with rites and customs punctuated by the periodic appearances of the phantom ship and its precious cargo. For centuries, nothing changed the Ark's mysterious cycle, only the size of the mammals changed, reducing uh, imperceptibly over time, so they got smaller. Until one day, a hundred or so years ago, the Ark turned earlier than expected, it was empty. The Yukos were dumbfounded and utterly confused. The spirits of their ancestors had forsaken them. Everything they had believed in that had been the bedrock of their culture since the very depths of time had now lost all meaning. The most fanatical beliefs note that the frequency of appearances had in fact increased and maintained that there was still hope as long as the Ark continued its return journeys from the unknown. Some elder Yugos boasted having seen it several times, but thenceforth each time the white ship returned it only offered an empty shell to the despairing eyes of the surviving Yugos. The belief became superstition and the reality became a legend. So they lost their ways. Let's, let's also remember too get the doll. And with that, I think we're done here. So, I think it is once again time to return to the train. And while I still remember it, we might put the toy back where it belongs and add the cylinder to the cabinet, unless I can find some way to play it. That'd be nice. And I'm still refusing to talk to that rude guy.
Okay. Minimap would have been so nice. I have said this before, but every time you just need to get to places, it would be so nice to be able to go there a bit more quickly. Everything okay? Yes, Kate Walker. I am waiting to continue our journey. Speaking of mechanical problems, there aren't any other hitches I should know about, Oscar? This train has no mechanical problems, Kate Walker. Winding the spring mechanism is standard service procedure. Okay, okay, Oscar. Don't get all touchy about it. I didn't mean it like that. Oscar, get ready. I'm going to start winding up the clockwork engine. Good, Kate Walker. Then we can carry on our journey. An engineer prides himself on punctuality. I know, Oscar, I know. All right. I'm off, Oscar. See you later. Yes, Kate Walker. I think we're done with him for now. So we uh, need to wind up the train again. And I, let's see. Mammoth back on the little plinth. There we go. Wonder can we Hans, I have some very sad news. Our father is dead. He passed away peacefully last Sunday in his sleep. I feel so lonely now. Father had been but a shadow of himself since your departure. I had to take care of everything for him. Housework, factory paperwork, the workforce, clients, everything. And now, today, well, I really don't know who or what I'm fighting for. Times are so hard, and this terrible war is destroying everything. Nobody cares for our automatons anymore. I just think about you returning. And when you do return, I will have turned this factory into a palace worthy of your genius. Please take care of yourself. I love you so much, Anna. Nice, I thought that looked like... Okay, cool, so she actually just went there and placed it as well. So yeah, we have a way to listen to the cylinders if we want to, which is nice. Okay, let's um, wind up the train then. Nice. I think we have... We cannot do anything else. Okay. Hello? Where are you? <laughs> Hi, Dan. I'm in Bergstadt. What? Is that a town? I hope the man you're looking for lives there. Are you coming home soon? 
From what I gather, it's one huge university with an extraordinary station aviary. If you could only see it, there are trees and birds everywhere. It's so weird here. Sounds like a great place for a bit of sightseeing. So, are you coming back soon? I don't think so. In fact, the train I'm traveling on has some kind of a mechanical problem. We've been forced to stop here. Us? I thought you were alone. Who's with you? Oscar, the train engineer. You're messing around with mechanics now, are you? Don't be so stupid, Dan, please. Oscar is an automaton created by Mr. Varlberg, the man I'm looking for. And he's not any old robot. He's a sophisticated butler type, if you see what I mean. He's a bit obsessive as well. Kate, I don't know what they're feeding you in Europe, but don't you think it's time that you came home? But my mission still isn't finished. To hell with your mission. I don't know why you accepted it in the first place. If you just stuck to the middle of the road, then we wouldn't be in this mess. We? If there's any mess, it's me who's in it. And while I'm trying to come to grips with strange towns, you, my darling, are sitting at home on your butt. I seem to remember we had nothing against my departure. It was only going to be two or three days, Kate. Please, try to put yourself in my shoes. Your shoes? Not only do I have to fit myself into your diary, but I've got to get myself into your shoes as well? Is there anywhere else Sir would like me to put myself while we're on this subject? Look, I don't want to talk about it now. Call me back when you've calmed down. I was perfectly calm before I picked up your call. I only wanted a few words of encouragement, not your disdain. Was that too much to ask? You can be such a selfish... Takes one to know one, sweetheart. Yeah, he can go straight to whatever place people like him go to. He's a complete asshole. And, yeah, hate him. I hope, I really hope something bad happens to him eventually. Down the road. Because we ain't got time for people like that. Anyway, uh, what are we doing? What are we doing? So the train is fixed up, I think. Uh, maybe we should just head inside and talk to Oscar again. See what he says. I wouldn't be surprised if... I mean, I kind of like Oscar, but I wouldn't be surprised if he wants, like, a ticket again. Because he's a stickler for rules. Everything okay? Yes, Kate Walker. I am waiting to continue our journey. Mission time. Oscar, if you tell me one more time something's missing, I'll... Everything is ready. Take your seat, Kate Walker. We are leaving. I'll... Okay... Well, he surprised me there. I will have to say that. Um, what happened? I guess we got... I guess the wall is in the way now? Yeah. So, I don't think we can do anything with that at the moment. This, however, unfortunately looks like a ticket booth. What are you doing there, Oscar? It is imperative that we comply with railroad and customs regulations, Kate Walker. Oscar, don't you think we could drop the trifling details once and for all? We need an exit visa to get beyond the wall, Kate Walker. And you wouldn't know where I could get one of them from, would you? 
There is usually some form of authority stationed at a guard post that is strategically positioned to issue such a visa. Oscar, don't you think we've wasted enough time already? You neglected to find the clockwork winding mechanism for the train with sufficient haste, Kate Walker. What nerve! And you refused to lend a helping hand, help that could have been invaluable to me. I agree, Kate Walker. If you weren't so obsessed by procedure, we wouldn't have had a hitch. I am not entirely convinced, Kate Walker. Oscar, please, let's get in the train and leave, can we? Yes, Kate Walker. Give me the visa. Okay, then. Okay. See you later, Oscar. Yes, Kate Walker. Okay, so we need to... Uh... We need to get... Okay, we go inside. No point. It's locked. How did he get inside? Oscar has some strange ways, that's for sure. There's anything down here? Hello? Kate! Oh, is that you? What's going on? Well, I finally got the mechanical train wound, and I hope it's going to take me to Hans Varlberg. I had to sort things out with a couple of weirdo sailors, and they probably ripped me off. But now I'm blocked behind this massive wall. You should see it, it's huge. I'm not talking about that. I want to know what's going on with Dan. What do you mean? I bumped into him at Maggie's do and he said you'd argue. That's a bit over the top. Things got a bit heated the last time we called, that's all. No need to go overboard. I don't mean to be Miss Melodramatic, but he didn't seem in such great shape. He had his down in the dumps head on. <laughs> like Dan has a down in the dumps head. Well, yeah, when that shock of hair flops over his forehead and his eyes mist up and his eyebrows kind of crease together. I'd never noticed. Maybe I did go a bit too far, but he's got such a goody two-shoes image of me that sometimes I just lose it. And this case is taking up a lot of headspace. I was just looking for a bit of compassion. Well, you sure got mine. So, what's going down? Like I said before, I'm kind of getting somewhere, but it's slow. This Hans Vorlberg guy is getting more and more fascinating by the day. Okay, well, anyway, it doesn't sound like you're bored. Not like back here in the office. Every day is boredom day. It's just no fun without you. When are you coming back? Shouldn't be long, I hope. Look, I've got to go. See you soon. Well, call us again real soon. And be easier on Dan next time, huh? I'll try. Let's not be easier on Dan next time. Let's absolutely be, you know, as unpleasant as we get. Is her friend also kind of interested in Dan? Then if she is, she can have him. No point. It's locked. Also, it's a little funny that her friend mentioned that she had already ran into Dan at one of, like a party. And we just talked to him. So, you know, I guess that's game logics, uh, but it's a little fun because I think, what, was it a couple of minutes between us hanging up on him and he apparently being away on a party, talking to her and then her getting back and calling us? Game logics. Anyway, what do we have here? Little outpost. Interesting. Look, broken glasses. If they belong to the captain, then he sure has eye problems going by those lenses. Uh -huh. I have 
haven't got time to have a drink right now. Oh. I haven't got time to have a drink right now. But there are glasses. Oh well. Okay, so the focus isn't amazing. Looks like something on top of something else. I mean, couldn't we drink the the thingy, the um, Yangala, to get better eyesight? There's no consume though. Good day to you, sir. Captain Melatesta, Commander in Chief of the Barikstadt Border Post, at your service, madam. My name is Kate Walker. I've been assigned by my company to find a man who was supposed to be living in Siberia. What a peculiar mission. Taking so many risks for such a futile goal. Captain, to my mind, the military zeal with which you insist on guarding this meaningless wall strikes me as equally futile. I should be offended by your words, miss, but I forgive you, because you are young and unaware of the very real dangers lurking in store for us. I need a visa to cross the wall and to continue my journey to the east. They told me that you are the only person in a position to issue such a visa. Indeed, this responsibility is part of my duties. However, I am not currently issuing visas, because nobody must venture beyond the Wall. And why not? It's far too dangerous, in particular for a lady of your standing who is traveling unescorted. Dangerous? What exactly do you mean, Captain? The enemy, miss. The enemy. I've been observing them for several years through my telescope. There's one particular horseman stationed yonder. He's a scout from the invading enemy army, and he's been spying on us. So I have to be extremely vigilant. He knows that I know he's there, you understand? And as long as I keep my eye on him, he won't dare try anything. Are you sure? Please, take a look for yourself. I did. I'm not convinced. Is the person who takes care of the gate anywhere around? There is no person who takes care of the gate. Believe you me, ma'am. I have been the one and only guardian of this gate since 1968. That year I took over the position from the late Lieutenant Colonel Malatesta, my own father. In that case, can you tell me how the mechanism works? It sure looks complicated to me. Not at all. It is child's play for anyone who takes the time to work out its surprisingly straightforward logic. And from the looks of your locomotive, it shouldn't pose you any problems. Why do you say that? When I caught sight of your formidable locomotive, I immediately said, Heavens, only Hans Vorlberg could design such an engine. And I know what I'm talking about, ma'am, because he invented the gate's original mechanism. It was his last creation here in Barkstadt. So you know Hans Vorlberg? No, I mean, not personally. I was only a baby when he stayed in Barkstad. My father spoke often of him, and I knew about his inventions. He left very many things behind him. I know. In any case, I noticed that his fantastic knack for inventing has not deteriorated with age. How's he doing? I don't know. In fact, I don't actually know him. I'm searching for him. An inheritance matter. I hope his train is going to lead me to him. And why not? His inventions are always full of surprises. Between the station aviary and this bleak wall, the change in atmosphere is radical, don't you think? It's been a long time since I've been at liberty to judge, miss. My duties forbid me from abandoning my post. He's been here his entire life. Don't mind me if I retire, Captain. Please, madam. My respects. Alright, so we need him to change his mind. He's also blind. Maybe we can give the 
enhancer to him in some fashion. But we will have to do that in the next part. Thank you for being along on the lecture with me. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I would love if you dropped a sub or a like. And if I saw you again in the next part. But for now, it is time to say bye-bye.